Christmas bells rang out, glam rockers sang out, the shops filled with tinsel, the charts filled with minstrels, with hits that the radio cranked out. Well, here we go down to the dusty end of 1973. Will it be shiny, solid gold or tawdry, tarnished brass? Listen on, good listener, listen on. At number 10 is a stone glam rock classic. Loved it then, love it now. Barry Blue's Dancing on a Saturday Night. Blue, whose real name is Green, but changed it because Green is seen as unlucky among showmen, had a long career, having written dozens of songs for top artists such as Diana Ross, Celine Dion, Danny Minogue, the not-as-good Minogue girl, and the unforgettable I Eat Cannibals for Toto Coelho. He's also produced dozens of albums for other artists, as well as writing songs or themes for movies and TV. Pretty good career for a five-hit wonder, but this is the one everyone remembers, and it's just dandy fun. Assuming its usual place after number 10 is 9, and it's the old Rolling Stones with the yawn-inducing Angie. This is, in my opinion, one of the weakest singles they released, but yet... Joe Public bought it up in crazy numbers, getting it to number two, only to be thwarted in its bid for the top by the record currently at number eight. Off the album Goat's Head Soup, which probably will be a lot better regarded had it not followed a run of five or so brilliant albums and had the temerity to be merely extremely interesting. It was Jimmy Miller's last record with the band and that ended an era in itself. Number 8 is a bizarre record, My Name is Pegasus by local singer-songwriter Ross Ryan, sort of a dollar store Cat Stevens, which managed not only 4 weeks at number 1 in November, but racked up a phenomenal 34 weeks in the top 40, which makes it one of the very longest running hits we've had. Fernando and Mamma Mia had 32 and 33 weeks respectively by way of comparison. It's a pleasant enough song, it just seems to be one four minute long chorus, but that level of demand for the song flabbergasts me. Flabbergasts, I tell you. At number seven is Don Gibson's lively Touch the Morning. Gibson, who had the nickname The Sad Poet for his songs of lost love, didn't write this one, which would account for its sunnier nature. One of the more interesting things about it is the solo, which is played either on amplified banjo or banjo guitar, or a Dan Electro-Electric Sitar. I really hope it's the latter. This is one of the handful of songs this week that vanished after the Christmas break. In or about the top 10 the week before the holidays and poof, gone as soon as the calendar turned over to 1974. Number six is another stone glam rock classic. Stone classic. The kind of song glam rock tragics like me build our record collections on. The Ballroom Blitz by Sweet. A 2B number one, and a rare one at that, in as much as it lost top spot, fell as low as number four, then bounced back for another week aloft. One can't help to think but Sweet were a better band than their catalogue might suggest. The first two years were spent almost as a novelty band until they came across the combination of who like ramped up riffs, four to the floor drumming, and weird high pitched vocals. Then they became a glam hit factory repositioning themselves a little closer to hard rock with each successive album. They managed nine top 40 hits and a few well-known and loved songs that hovered just outside the 40, but the odds are that this is truly their most beloved song. It's time for Hello Goodbye, the section where we review the new and toss out all the dross. This week's model is The Monster Mash by Bobby Boris Pickett and the Crip Kickers, a reissue of a record that charted for seven weeks in 1962 and never made the top 10, which was up from 13 to 3, and we waved goodbye to the Sutherland Brothers' I Don't Want to Love You But You Got Me Anyway, a song I didn't immediately recognise until I listened to it and realised it's just one of those songs that gets in the back of your head at some point, and then it instantly triggers recognition when you hear it. It fell from its peak of 10 to 13 this week. The next number one record was, well I won't insult your intelligence because you'll be able to work it out if I tell you anything at all, it is the Monster Mash. But this is interesting, like 1962 the record managed a seven week run on the charts and made number one. Seven weeks is the shortest chart span we've ever seen for a number one record so far. 
Other short timers include The High Woman by Michael and Santiano, who had an 11 week run, as did Look Out Here Comes Tomorrow by The Monkees and Little Red Rooster by The Stones. At 12 weeks, we had uh, You're the Devil in Disguise by Elvis Presley and Judy in Disguise by John Fred, as well as Liv Mason's Knock Knock Who's There and Brian Adams' Everything I Do, which did spend 11 of his 12 weeks at number one. Back to the countdown and down we shall count to number five in the hard rock and hollies with the day curly Billy shot down crazy Sam McGee, clearly wanting to emulate the success of long cool woman in a black dress. This is almost as good, but for some reason it only really charted in my little town. It was, however, back to business as usual with their next hit, the decidedly hollies like The Air That I Breathe. Number four is the so-so like sister and brother by a band legendary in name only, The Drifters. The most noteworthy thing about this record is the sheer tenacity with which it clung to the charts, a record thus far only bettered by Rick Astley, Player One, ABBA, Twice and Old Ross Ryan. Like I said, so-so, but it appears now and then, so-so sells. For all the great records on this week's charts, the Monster Mash at number three is my favourite. I don't know why, I, I just love it. Initially recorded in 1962 when it was a minor hit, it rocketed up the charts this time out, hitting number one for the last two weeks of the year and then unaccountably disappearing, which makes me think there's actually something wrong with the charts. It's just one of those songs that takes the slightest trigger to start a sing-along, and everyone I know my age knows it. A classic. Number two is Olivia John, the 70s answer to Kylie Minogue, and her boppy If You Love Me Let Me Know, which won her a nomination at the CMAs as Best New Talent. This caused some feuding and a fussin' when legend Gene Shepard started a petition to ban pop performers from the award, apparently having a beef with the fact that an Australian girl from the leafy and somewhat posh inner southern suburbs of Melbourne with her perfectly rounded vowels could be an authentic country singer. The fact of the matter is that while this was her second US pop top 10, her phrasing and inflection is unmistakably classic country. Her pitching, though, at the beginning is a bit iffy. Elvis Presley cut a version of this on his last album, Moody Blue. One more bit of ONJ trivia, she went to primary school with Daryl Braithwaite, lead singer of Sherbet. Morrissey once informed us that the world was full of crashing bores. Well, he'd know. But it's also full of fantastic, fantastic facts, and here's a handful to be going on with. The biggest riser this week was the 4IP Radio Good Guys with the cheery holiday novelty Please Daddy Don't Get Drunk This Christmas, which was written by John Denver. Of course, this was the only chart it charted on, the 4IP chart. 14 was as high as it got and it vanished from the charts once Christmas was over and Dad presumably had sobered up. The biggest dropout this week was Smoke on the Water down 6 spots to 26. In their pomp, Deep Purple were much more popular in Australia than Led Zeppelin. Highest debutante was Mr George with Lazy Susan entering at number 34. Mr George was a Sydney band. No one had ever heard of any of the members and they'd never, or so it would seem, been in any bands previously. They had four middling hits, made an album, then vanished and were never heard of again, jointly or severally. And the grand old lady of the charts this week is Delta Dawn by Helen Reddy, hanging in for its 21st week. In the US of A, it was the Silver Fox himself, Charlie Rich, with the second of his two number one hits that year, behind closed doors. Rich personally disliked country music, considering himself a jazz musician. His opening act on one of his early 70s tours was Tom Waits, who was a great admirer, name-checking him in the song Putnam County on Nighthawks at the Diner. Rich's career hit turbulent waters when he was caught up in the ONJ-inspired purge of pop singers from the Country Music Awards. After making out like a bandit in 1974, he was locked out in 1975, which annoyed him, to say the least. 
called upon to read out the Best Male Artist winner, a visibly drunk Rich opened the envelope, looked at the name in there, and then set fire to the envelope. He then announced, My very good friend, John Danver, as the winner, as he rightfully was. Rich found work harder to come by after that, but he still had some notable successes, playing himself in a Clint Eastwood film, at least he didn't play the monkey, and finally getting to make a jazz album, which was well received. In the UK, just to reinforce Glam's Annus Mirabilis, Slade held down the number one spot with Merry Christmas, everybody. One year ago, our charts were decorated, indeed adorned and honoured, by being topped by the mighty T-Rex with Children of the Revolution. And a year later, it was Olivia who loved us. She honestly loved us. Number one album in town this week, breaking hot August night's stranglehold on the top, which it was to resume shortly, was the much maligned Goat's Head Soup by the Rolling Stones, which spent a month looking down on all others. It has been pointed out by some that Monty is in fact a lesser ape, not a monkey. I know that, but I don't care. Drum you mighty monkey drum. Number one this week is Leave Me Alone by Helen Reddy. Basically taking the extremely successful template from Delta Dawn, Reddy spent two weeks on top here after disposing of I Am Pegasus. An interesting number one, number two crossover, there was a period when to the rest of the world the Australian music industry was basically Helen Reddy, the Bee Gees and Olivia Newton-John. And Reddy greatly encouraged Olivia when she first came to the States by sharing contacts, etc. It was in fact at a party at Helen Reddy's house where Olivia met the casting agent for Greece and fell into contention for the role of Sandy. Well, there we have it. That's how the cow ate the cabbage. From our next edition, we'll be dropping the weekly rating and replacing it with what I call averaged hit strength. We're now having amassed enough entries in my logarithmic calculator. Top tens will be rated in the average score of all the ten hits on the charts. Don't worry, you'll get it. Bigger is better. The method is just less subjective in this case. Be that as it may, if the good Lord's willing and the creeks don't rise, we'll be back with a new edition next week. Ish.